Here are the notes for chapter 6. This is the appendicular skeleton, and the word comes from appendages, and that would be your arms and your legs, uh, which they call in this the upper limbs and lower limbs. It's also your pelvic girdle and your shoulder girdle. So this first picture is showing you your uh, shoulder or your pectoral girdle. And there's a few things that we need to, to talk about in this picture. Uh, first of all, they've got the um, scapula reversed. And you can tell that because here's the medial border. And medial means in the middle. And lateral means in the outside. So there's your lateral border. So in your mind, if you could take this and move it over here and take this one and move it over there then you'll be a little bit less confused there's also a typo uh, this is not a chromial it's a chromion a c r o m i o n process a chromion and so that'll help you a little bit there so this is the socket this is the area where your um, humerus is going to articulate so you have that that range of motion that you have with your shoulder and this is where you are uh, making the joint with the top of your humerus the acromion process this hook right here this is the anterior view so the hook points towards the front and it's where you're going to hook on to the clavicle and down here is your clavicle and this is pretty easy I don't think anybody's gonna mess up the clavicle this end is the sternal end so that's the one that's gonna articulate with the sternum and there's the acromial end which is going to articulate with the acromion process the spine is in the posterior view so when you see this big attachment area the spine you know that you're looking at the back of the shoulder but again remember this should be over on the other side uh, because your uh, humerus is going to articulate there and your clavicle is going to articulate there and you need this to be over here in order to do that all right so getting that uh, hopefully straightened out a little bit the key things remember that this one hooks and points towards the front remember if you see the spine you're looking at the back that's going to help you and then if you literally just take that and put it on your own shoulder put it in your mind put it on your back and then you'll be able to tell the left from the right all right A couple more interesting things if you look at this particular um, clavicle you see that it looks like you could hold it right here and then this looks kind of like a foot so a lot of people when they make hammer dulcimers they play it using a bone and this is a perfect bone because it has a handle and then it has a striking area so the acromial end is the striking area um, one of the things I forgot to point out was the coracoid process, and there is your glenoid fossa there in, on both of your uh, left and right scapula. So I think that's all the words you need to know on that one. Just don't get lateral and medial mixed up because the uh, picture is wrong. Lateral is always outside, medial is always in the middle. So this is reversed. It's labeled correctly, but it's reversed in the, the picture. You have six long bones in your body. You have the femurs. Humeruses. Tibias. Fibulas. Ulnas. And radii. So, actually that's twelve. You have two of each now you got to figure out what's the difference between the long bones how can you differentiate between them and how can you tell which is the left and which is the right well it's going to be pretty easy because on the femur 
you have the head and the neck and that's the thing that fits into the acetabulum or the pocket on your pelvic uh, bone your pelvic girdle so obviously that has to be on the interior side or the medial side of your leg because you can't have it fitting into a socket and sticking out the other way so if you look down here at the bottom you have a medial condyle and a lateral condyle so you may be sitting there trying to figure out well this one's a little bigger this one's a little smaller this one sticks out a little further but if you just go up there and go well there's the head so obviously that's the medial side because it has to fit into your leg socket or your hip socket so that's going to be pretty easy so you need to know about the greater trochanter now that one if you look at it from this side it just looks like it ought to be uh, a tubercle which would be a potato shaped thing but when you see it from the posterior view then you see that it's actually kind of a hooked um, object or projection or process on your bone all right if you look at the humerus compared to the femur you can see that this has a neck and this doesn't have a neck so that should make that one fairly easy for you and the giveaway for me that I have a hold of a humerus is this little thing right here and that's the hinge part that's where you're going to fit in the lower bone to make your elbow so that's your oleocranon fossa right there and there's your lateral epicondyle lateral means to the outside of the body and again that makes sense because the head is going to fit into your shoulder socket so it wouldn't make any sense to have this uh, on the outside so there's your lateral and then there's your medial so if you look at the head you'll always know which is the lateral which is the medial because it only makes sense one way so that's some of the tricks of the trade of figuring out what's going on there now you have a lesser trochanter that you can see on the posterior view. Now remember, posterior is towards the back of you. So there's your lesser trochanter. Whenever you have a process or something sticking out, it's almost always because you're going to have a muscle, uh, ligament, tendon attached to the bone at that point. And so it has a projection sticking out for it to attach to. Here is the patellar surface. So again, if you think about this is the head and this is the part that's going to plug into your pelvic bone, then coming straight down, that's where the kneecap would be because it's on the front of your uh, body and, and not the back. So again, that's going to tell you that this is the anterior view or the front because that's where the patella is going to be. So a lot of this is common sense, and but it's kind of overwhelming when you see all of these words that you've never seen before. It's like, oh my goodness. So just, just stop and take a deep breath. Okay. Now, this has an obvious neck, and this one they call a surgical neck. It's not as, it is not as obvious as this neck is over here. Uh, let's see. There's your trochlea, your capitulum. And I remember that to, it's capitulate. It means to give in. I just, I give in. Fine. Whatever. I capitulate. So that's your capitulum. It just gives in. Uh, lateral epicondyle, medial epicondyle. Uh, look at that one. This is a condyle over here on your femurs, and it is a, an epicondyle on your humerus. So pay attention to that so you don't get those two mixed up. Here are your other long bones. The tibia and fibula are your lower bones. If something is close to your body, we say it's proximal. And if it's distant from your body, we say it's distal. So distant and distal sound kind of alike. So you should be able to do that one. And in close proximity to someone means it's close to you. So your femur is in close proximity to your body, as is your humerus.
and these are further away. So these are your distal bones. Each of the leg bones are going to be, there's a big one and a small one, and in the arm bones there's a bigger one and a smaller one. So in the case of the lower in your leg, the tibia is also known as your shin bone, and the fibula is kind of easy to remember because it's the tinier leg bone, and it's like you're telling a tiny fib. You're just telling a little lie. So the fibula is the little one, and the tibia is the big one. The tibia doesn't actually have a knob on it. If you look at that, it's more like a, a wedge, I suppose. And behind that is the lateral condyle. So lateral, again, means closer to the outside. Medial condyle, closer to the inside. And there's the tibial tuberosity. So remember, tuberosity means like potato shape. So there's your tuber right there. And there's your anterior crest, which is known as your shin. And down here is the medial uh, malleolus. And there is your lateral malleolus over on the fibula. So you can tell which of the bones is going to be on the outside and which is going to be on the inside uh, from that. Uh, this also has a head on the fibula up there and here's the head of the radius and that's the giveaway that you know you have a hold of the radius because this is a flat it is a flat disc so it's really uh, sticks out now on the ulna there's the oleocranian process the trochlear notch and the radial notch so obviously the radial notch is going to be associated with the radius. Uh, there's a radial tuberosity sticking out there. So obviously that's a point of attachment for something that we'll learn later. Here is your styloid process right there. And let's see. I think that's it. Those are the things that you have to know from your distal limbs, your lower arms, lower legs. These are the three fused bones that make up your pelvis. So you have a left set and a right set. The big one is the ilium, and this is the uh, iliac crest right there so if you put your hands on your hips when you're mad about something that's where you're putting your hands right on top of this bone right here and where they're fused you're not going to find suture lines you're not going to find something really obvious to show where they're fused unless of course you've got a, a very young skeleton and this right here it's kind of hard to see in the picture is the uh, socket where the top of the femur, the head of the femur, is going to fit in there. And they named it the vinegar cup, which is so odd. But anyway, I'm not responsible for that. It's the acetabulum. Acetic acid is another name for vinegar. So that's the acetabulum, and it's the socket for the uh, femur to fit in right there. So all of this top part is the ilium. And this lower part is the ischium. And this is in the back. This would be more posterior. And the pubis, or the pubic bone, is the one in the front. And right here is where the pubic symphysis is, where the left and the right half of the hips are joined, right there. Now, be careful because ilium and ischium both start with I, and they're really easy to get confused. This is the iliac crest that I was talking about at the top of the ilium. And here you have the posterior superior iliac spine. So again, the spine is a point of attachment right there. Posterior means that's pointing towards your backside. Here is your anterior superior iliac spine and it is of course pointing towards the front and it's superior so you know that there must be an inferior one right under it so inferior means below 
So anterior superior iliac spine, anterior inferior iliac spine. And same thing with the posterior superior. Here's a greater sciatic notch right here. And then there's the lesser sciatic notch down here. Here's the ischial spine sticking out there. So something's going to be attached there. And there's your ischial tuberosity. Again, potato looking. Anytime you have a hole, remember it's called a foramen. And this is the obturator. It's with a T, not obturator, obturator, foramen. You know this is the front of the, of the bone because there's the pubic symphysis. There's where the, the two halves of your pelvic girdle fit together. So that's where I look first. And I go, okay, there's the front of it. So that's the anterior. And then there's the posterior back here. And then you can work out which is superior and which is inferior. And your sciatic notch and uh, lower, the greater and lower are important because your sciatic nerve is one of the ones that is commonly pinched, especially in older people or people who uh, stand too long, things like that. They, they get sciatica. And so they have a, a problem with the sciatic nerve. Here are your two pubic bones or pelvic girdle put together with the pubic symphysis right there. And they've also shown you how the, here are the bones of the hand. And if you notice, here are the fingers right here, the phalanges. But most people, when they're looking at a skeleton, assume that this is also part of the finger, and it's not. These are the bones that are in the palm of your hand, right in through there. So one of the things that will help you remember this is when you look at pictures of uh, people who have been crucified and nailed to a cross, they often show a nail in the palm of the hand. Well, if you were to try and hang somebody up by the palm of their hand, there's nothing to hold them up but just a little bit of skin right here. So they would just rip down. So uh, a realistic would be back here between the um, long bones at the lower arm and the wrist. That would be, and that way you have the bones to hold the nail in place. So that's kind of a gruesome and gross thing, but hopefully it'll keep you from getting the wrist, which are the carpal bones, and the metacarpal, which are your palm bones, and your fingers, your phalanges, uh, uh, from getting those confused. All right. Uh, one of the things that I'd like for you to pay a close attention to is the radius. So here's the radius right there, and there's your ulna up there, which is a smaller bone. And the radius is going to be the one closest to your thumb. The radius is the one closest to your thumb. And that's going to be important because when you're putting on a blood pressure cuff, you always want to line the blood pressure cuff up with the radial artery, which is running right along here. All right, now if you move down to the bone of the foot, if my computer will behave, all right, you have the same phalanges. Here's your phalanges. So these fingertips were phalanges, these three outer bones, and these three um, bones make up the toes. And then this would be the arch of your foot, the metatarsals. And then the tarsals make up your ankle. So there's your ankle. Now here's where the tibia comes down and attaches to the foot. You don't have to know the names of all the individual tarsals. You may have to if you're going into radiography, if you're going into physical therapy. But for this course, you don't have to know that. You just have to know that these are the ankle bones. And except for, we would like for you to know the talus, which is the one that connects to the tibia, and the calcaneus, which is your heel bone. 
So there's your heel bone. So these are all your tarsal bones. These and your talus and your calcaneus are also tarsal bones. But we actually are going to learn the names of those two. And these will remain a mystery. The next set of things we're going to talk about are your joints. And that's what you and I would call them. This is my finger joint. This is my elbow joint. But uh, the proper name for it is articulation. So it's where two bones come together. And we can take all the joints in your body and group them into three different categories. So one of them are your fibrous joints. And these are your joints that do not move. You do not want these to move at all. So the sutures that we learned on your skull, those are actually fibrous joints until you get really old and then they just turn into bone. And the tibiofibular joints, so where the tibia and the fibula meet, you don't want those to act as independent bones. You want them to act as a unit. So you've got them tightly uh, uh, together. And the radio ulnar, the same deal. You don't want those bones working independently. You want them to be attached to work as a unit. So you're going to tightly uh, tie them together with fibrous uh, connective tissue. And the gomphoses, a gomphosis is the tooth socket. So if you pull your tooth out, that hole that's sitting there inside of your jawbone, that's called a gomphosis. And you definitely don't want that to move because then your teeth would fall out. So you want that to be very, very tight. Then you have the cartilaginous joints. And these you want to have just a little bit of give, not much. And you want them to be really, really strong. So you're going to find those in your uh, intervertebral joints. So between your vertebra is where you're going to find those. In your pubic symphysis. So you definitely don't want the two halves of your pelvic uh, girdle to fall apart by the pubic symphysis letting go. And the joint between the manubrium and the sternum. So your breastbone is the sternum. And remember the top of it is called the manubrium. And uh, used to your sternum was made up of several bones, but they've all fused together. But you still have a little bit of, uh, of uh, cartilaginous uh, material between the manubrium and the sternum. And then your epiphyseal plate. And the epiphyseal plate we've talked about uh, is very, very important. That's the part of the bone where your long bones are growing. So you have epiphyseal plates on your long bones. And if uh, something happens and you break your bone in or near the epiphyseal plate before you finish growing, so before you're 18 to 21 years old, then whatever bone, wherever it breaks, it will heal the epiphyseal plate. And the cartilaginous joint will no longer be able to um, allow bone growth at that plate. It's also known as a growth plate. The epiphyseal plate is also known as the growth plate. So it's always important if you're younger than 21 years old and you break an arm or a leg that you go and make sure that the break doesn't extend through the epiphyseal plate because then you'll end up with one arm longer than the other or one leg longer than the other one. So those are cartilaginous and they don't give very much if at all. And then your third group are your synovial joints and these are the ones that you want to be mobile. You want them to be moving. So we're going to look at the knee, and you're going to need to know the parts of the knee. Here is a cartoon model of a knee joint, and this is your femur coming in here. It's heart-shaped. On the outside of a bone, you're going to have a layer of connective tissue, and on the ends of it, you're going to end up with uh, what we call a synovial membrane and it's made of hyaline cartilage it is kind of spongy in that it can hold fluid and when you start walking or start exercising as you are using this joint you're going to push more fluid out into this space 
and then if you're just sitting around not doing anything, the fluid will be absorbed back in. So a lot of times, especially you see old people and they have trouble when they stand up because their joints aren't very fluid. They're not very lubricated and it takes a minute for them to walk and get the joints lubricated to where they're walking more normally. All right? You have uh, fluid. There it tells you there's your synovial fluid right there. And then you have uh, meniscus. So this one is your excuse me, lateral meniscus and this is your medial meniscus. So that tells you the orientation. Lateral will be towards the outside of your body, medial towards the inside of your body. And this is uh, we'll, this will be more obvious when we look at the at the long bone and the inside of it. But right here is where the bone marrow is. So if you're coming on down, there's a bunch of bone marrow in this particular area. And that's known as the medullary cavity or the bone marrow cavity right there. So this is just the top of it right there. And then there would be one here, but you're not actually seeing it. And this is called the spongy bone or the cancellous bone. And one of the neat things in our laboratory is we actually have bones from uh, a, a formerly living person. I mean, they're not plastic. They're actually real bones from a dead person. And because they've had them for so long, they've actually taken and worn away a lot of the hard outer uh, bone out here and you can actually see the spongy bone inside. I backed up to this picture so you could see what I was talking about. If you look right here, you can see where some of the uh, hard bone, the outer bone, is worn away and you can see the spongy area that's underneath of it. And the spongy bone is called cancellous. So this pink area is a, a cartoon version, uh, an artist's representation of what they think that the cancellous bone looks like or the spongy bone looks like. All right, right here is a fibrous capsule. In this particular picture, it's green. They, they've colored it green. And then outside of that is the tibial collateral ligament. There's the tibial collateral ligament. So those are the parts of a synovial joint, and the knee is a typical one. So each of your joints will be a little bit different, but they'll have the synovial fluid. They'll have the hyaline cartilage on the end of the bone. Um, they'll have the spongy bone. So those things are, are pretty uh, common from one synovial joint to the other. And you do have to have these long outer ligaments to hold these bones in place. For the shoulder, you only need to know two of the ligaments. You need to know the coracohumeral ligament, which is this one right here, and then you need to know the glenohumeral ligament, which is the one right here. So these are the ones that stabilize your humerus and attach it so that your, your arm is attached to your body so they're rather important. I remember them because the coro excuse me coracohumeral is alphabetically before the glenohumeral. You also have ligaments that are holding your pelvic bone to the top of your femur. And so this is the iliofemoral ligament. So it uses the name of the ilium and the femur as part of its name. So there's the iliofemoral, and it has more than one piece. There is an ischiofemoral ligament, but you can't see it in this particular picture. So number two, the ischiofemoral ligament is not visible in this picture. And then the pubofemoral ligament is the pubic bone attaching to the femur. So these help stabilize the bone and keep it in its socket. 
This picture should look familiar to you because you had it on another test. This happens to be the ligament that connects the tibia to the femur and it holds the kneecap in place. So it's called the patellar ligament. Some of you thought it was a, a tendon. And a tendon holds a muscle to a bone, but a ligament holds a bone to a bone. And then we have the um, lateral collateral ligament. The lateral collateral. So you know that that's gonna be away from the body and you can guess, well, then this must be the medial collateral ligament. So there you have the medial, and there you have the lateral again. And the lateral is going to be on your fibula, because your fibula is out, and your tibia is more in the medial position. And then inside here, we have the medial and the lateral meniscus. So here's the medial right there and there's the lateral meniscus and to me they look like breast implants I don't know maybe it's just me but they help keep these two bones from rubbing against each other you definitely don't want bone rubbing against bone and so that's why you need this uh, meniscus in there and unfortunately sports players seem to always tear their meniscus and if they're not tearing their meniscus, they're tearing their anterior cruciate ligament, or their ACL. So right there is the anterior cruciate ligament. So it attaches to the femur and comes back behind the posterior ligament. Right there. Now why they don't tear their posterior ligament, I don't know. But ACL is the one that always seems to be torn. Uh, every season when you're watching sports. Another couple of things that you need to pay attention to is this is the posterior ligament and so this is the posterior view of your knee joint and this is the uh, front and you can tell that one because it has the kneecap and you know your kneecap is in the front so it's going to be your anterior view. So that should help you a little bit with that. The other thing, look right here. This is where the fibula is very tightly attached to the tibia. So we talked about that when we said we have different kinds of joints. And this one is one kind of like the sutures. I don't want the pieces of my skull coming loose. And I certainly don't want the fibula to let go of the tibia when I'm busy walking. So this is very tightly held together right there. One of the very first things you guys learned on the very first lab was the correct anatomical position to stand in. So if you can see that picture in your mind, a person is standing there and they have their palms forward and they have the backs of their hands behind them. So the back of your hand is dorsal. So if you can see that, and your thumbs are pointing outward, so your thumbs are going to be distal to your body. They're going to be further out. They're going to be uh, more lateral. And if you remember your thumb, if you come up from your thumb, you come up to the radial bone, the radius. And this is important to remember because it's going to be considered lateral. So the only way that you're going to be able to remember which of these is the lateral and which is the medial is to remember if you come down from the radius, you're coming to the thumb. The thumb is going to be further away from the body. So that's going to be your lateral collateral ligament. And then the one over the ulna and the one that's making up your uh, elbow is called your medial collateral ligament. So those are the two you have to remember for your elbow. What makes this really hard in this picture is they put the picture upside down. So if you think about it, your humerus is at the top. It's closer to your body and your ulna and your radius are further down. They're the more distal bones. 
but this picture got put in upside down and so it's just a little bit confusing but just remember the radius is by your thumb and your thumb is further out so that's going to be your lateral wherever the radius is so that should help you even though the picture is upside down in the book that's it for this lab you notice at the end of the lab there's a nice summary of all the things you know need to know about the clavicle the scapula the humerus the radius they all know the carpals metacarpals phalanges uh, you need to know where the acetabulum is that's the vinegar cup it's the it's the little socket where the head of the femur fits you need to know the parts of the ilium so there's a number of pieces of the ilium but remember they're pretty much posterior inferior posterior superior anterior inferior anterior superior so basically it's not as much as it looks like it is and you need to know where the spine and the tuberosity and the notch are on the ischium so that should be pretty um, obvious and the obturator foramen is the hole in the pubic bone in the pubis and so on so there's a nice little summary there make sure that you know all of these for the test